Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today, which happens to be the 16th of the second month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it. And it is the 29th of April, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. We're continuing our study of the Book of Hanok, and we are currently going over the luminaries, and we are on chapter 78. Starting with chapter 72, we went through the cycle for the sun. It's gone over the uh, some of the cycle for the moon, although it's an abridged version of what we have. And then um, we also have some of the names of the stars and how it works out that way. We're going to be going over a little bit more of that. as we continue here. So, excuse me. Uh, it, it also covered the, the difference or the conjunction between the, the luminary, the sun and the stars with the moon. Although again, it was an abridged version, but it basically summed up that the moon is, the cycle for the moon is 10 days shorter than the cycle for the, the year or that is in conjunction with the sun. So after one year, it's 10 days behind two years it's 20 days behind and three years it's 30 days behind right and then it went up to like eight years it's 80 days behind but that was in the book of Hanok here trying to describe that phenomenon in the dead sea scrolls which ob willing will cover at a different time it goes through a three-year cycle and then it mentions that it repeats itself and that is the sign that the moon makes that it'll always be a full moon on the first night of the year every third year and that's a phenomenon that jerry morris started keeping track of since 2013 i've personally witnessed it since 2016 a few times now as well as the the friends that we have on this channel that we uh, do our studies with so we're still learning, but the moon being in conjunction with how the sun functions and lining up with reality for how the seasons work is what we're trying to keep track of and to make sure that it actually fits. All right, so we're currently on chapter 78, and I'm going to apologize in advance if I butcher these names. I'll try to tell you what they mean if I know it. And these are Greek-influenced Hebrew transliterated names. So it does not sound quite like it would in the Hebrew, and I can't always tell what it's supposed to mean. It says, and the names of the sun are the following. The first is Oreres, which is like the light of something. And the second, Thomas or Tomau, which is twin. And the moon has four names. The first is Asonia, the second, Ebla the third, Benes, and the fourth, Ere. Now, in the Hebrew, just as far as I'm aware, there's only two words for the moon. You have Shar, like where you get that, that female mighty one that's a false mighty one for the Greeks, Shar, or Selene, but that's the word for moon. And then you also have the word Yarach, and Yarach, like Jericho, or Yericho, is the based, you know, it's the luminary. It's, it's literally the Hebrew word for moon. When Yochebed, the, the daughter of Louis, the wife of Amram, the mother of Aharon, Miriam, Aharon, and Moshe, when she gave birth to Moshe, it says that she kept him for three moons or three Yarachim and not three months. So there's a distinction there, and there's reasons for it, but I just wanted to point out that's usually the word they use for the word for moon in Hebrew. These are all names that would have a meaning for the function that it has, but I don't know what they mean. It says, these are the two great luminaries. Their circumference is like the circumference of the Shemaim, and the size of the circumference of both is alike. In the circumference of the sun, there are seven portions of light which are added to it more than to the moon. 
meaning the sun is seven times brighter. And in definite measures, it is transferred till the seventh portion of the sun is exhausted. And they set and enter the portals of the west and make their revolution by the north and come forth through the eastern portals on the face of the Shemaim. We went over that last week, and I'll, I'll show you again in just a moment here. All right, so you can see right here, I'll show you both of them. The portals would be what you perceive from your from the ground, and you're looking. It's just the angle at the horizon. But it comes from the east, it goes to the south, sets in the west, and then it goes north again from your position back to the east. And it goes in a circuit like so. A little bit easier to see maybe is right here. But you start in the east, comes through the portal, goes to the south, sets in the west, and it goes north again from your from your position. It goes from the to the north back to the east. And it goes in a circuit like so, which is how that's described. All right. It says, we're on verse 6 now. And when the moon rises, one fourteenth part appears in the Shemaim. The light becomes full in her. On the fourteenth day, she accomplishes her light. Meaning that it starts off with the crescent as it's waxing, right? One fourteenth part. The next night, it would be two fourteenths or one seventh. Then the next it's three, the next four, the next five, and so on and so forth until after 14 days, it's a full moon. And then it would go through the next 15 to go into a dark moon and repeats the process. You have 29 day cycle, then a 30 day cycle, 29 day cycle, then a 30 day cycle, and it repeats itself over and over again. The one consistent pattern with the luminary or the moon is the first month is always a 29 day period for the year. This is in when the moon rises, one fourteenth part appears in the Shamayim, the light becomes full in her. On the 14th day, she accomplishes her light. And 15 parts of light are transferred to her till the 15th day. When her light is accomplished, according to the sign of the year, and she becomes 15 parts, and the moon grows by 14 parts, and in her waning, decreases on the first day to 14 parts of her light, and on the second to 13 parts of light, on the third to 12, on the fourth to 11, on the fifth to 10, on the sixth to 9, on the seventh to eight, on the eighth to seven, on the ninth to six, on the tenth to five, on the eleventh to four, on the twelfth to three, on the thirteenth to two, and on the fourteenth to the half of the seventh. Or it should have been one fourteenth, which would have been half of the seventh, right? And all her remaining light disappears wholly, on the 15th and in certain months the months has 29 days and once 28 now this i've no i don't know about i'm not familiar with it doing this at all we'd have to compare it with the other witnesses we can have in the dead sea scrolls and oriel showed me another law When light is transferred to the moon, and on which side it is transferred to her by the sun. So again, it mentions that the sun has all authority, and it empowers both the moon and the stars. This is something that it is repeated in Josephus, where it tells directly that the sun empowers the moon and the stars 
And then from there, all of them influence what's beneath them. And again, it's a type and picture of our Mashiach empowering his Malkuth Shemaim, or the kingdom of the heavens, if you will, and his children of light, and then having them be a benefit or a light to the world. This is during all the period during which the moon is growing in her light, she is transferring it to herself when opposite to the sun during 14 days, her light is accomplished in the Shamayim. And when she is illumined throughout, her light is accomplished full in the Shamayim. And on the first day, she is called the new moon. For on that day, the light rises upon her. And what they call the new moon here would be what they call Dok in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the, the crescent moon. The renewed moon is when it was full, would be the Chodesh. And that literally means, Chodesh means to be new, renewed, or restored. When they sing a Chodesh song, it's a new song. And that and that's how that's typically used throughout. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have the word Chodesh for the full moon, and you have the word for Dok, Dalit, Wa, Kuf, or D Dalit, Wa, Kuf, He, or Kof, He, as the word for to look exactly, to calculate accurately a minute, slim, a slim thin sliver. And that is the crescent moon, if you will. And it says, she becomes full moon exactly on the day when the sun sets in the west, and from the east she rises at night. And the moon shines the whole night through till the sun rises over against her, and the moon is seen over against the sun. So this is one witness on how to determine when the moon is full. Because sometimes it can look full, but if it doesn't actually rise when the sun is setting and then can be seen over against the sun as it's risen and she is setting on the horizon that's the sign that it was actually the full moon all right and this is on the side whence the light of the moon comes forth there again she wanes till all the light vanishes and all the days of the month are at an end and her circumference is empty void of light and three months she makes of 30 days and at her time she makes three months of 29 days each in which she accomplishes her waning in the first period of time and in the first portal for 177 days so in a six month period she has three months of 30 days and three months of 29 Right, And then that's repeated for the next six months for a total of six, 29, and six 30-day months. Right, And in the time of her going out, she appears for three months, 30 days each. And for three months, she appears of 29 each. So again, the second half of the year, right? At night she appears like a man for 20 days each time, and by day she appears like the Shemaim, and there is nothing else in her save her light. Which is a refutation for anyone thinking the moon is made out of cheese or is a rock that you can land on. Chapter 79 And now, my son, I have shown you everything. And the law of all the stars of the Shemaim is completed. And he showed me all the laws of these for every day, and for every season of bearing rule, and for every year, and for its going forth, and for the order prescribed to it every month and every week. And the waning of the moon, which takes place in the sixth portal, for in this sixth portal, her light is accomplished, 
And after that, there is the beginning of the waning. And the waning, which takes place in the first portal in its season, till 177 days are accomplished, reckoned according to weeks, 25 and 2 days. <clears throat> And she falls behind the sun and the order of the stars exactly five days in the course of one period. And when this place which you see has been transversed, so one period is half a year, and in half a year she falls behind five days. This is what you would call the retrograde that they see in the moon where it's 11 degrees retrograde from the sun every day. Okay. Such is the picture and sketch of every luminary which Oriel, the chief messenger who is their leader, showed unto me. And again, we don't get we don't get a lot of information about the, the constellations or the luminaries, all the stars that make up the constellations, and we don't get all the deacons or the other constellations that support them, nor do we have a name for all the wandering stars or all the, the stars that are for signs and seasons, like what we call Halley's Comet. <clears throat> but these things would have been known and enumerated to Hanok at that time, and he would have had a written record of them, both what he wrote down himself and what Oriel, the chief messenger, wrote down for him. Chapter 80. And in those days the messenger Oriel answered and said unto me, Behold, I have shown you everything, Hanok, and I have revealed everything to you that you should see this sun and this moon, and the leaders of the stars of the Shemaim, and all those who turn them, their tasks and times and departures. And this is subtitled Perversion of Nature and the Heavenly Bodies Owing to the Sin of Men. And in the days of the sinners, the years shall be shortened, and their seed shall be tardy on their lands and fields, and all things on the earth shall alter, and shall not appear in their time. Now, this doesn't mean that they would cease to exist, but things would be corrupted and perverted from what is actually true and right. And you can see that even today. If you have any examples of snowing during the summertime or snowing during the spring or having a late start to a season, these things, whether contrived by men and perpetrated by, by the instigation of minions of, of the enemy, which does happen. Um, a great example of that, and I can't, re I can't stop recommending it enough. If you look at the Antichrist for Dummies series or the anti mashiach for Dummies videos on YouTube, the YouTube channel is called ChristmasIsALie.com. They go into great detail about how the luminaries show forth different things that would happen and the stars in the sky point out the events that are going to transpire in the world. One of the things that it shows, however, is that men are responsible for the things that are happening, like the red tides. It has to do with chemicals and, and garbage being pushed out into the water. And the more we've done that through industry, the more you've had the red tides happen. This is a phenomenon that would have been known by the enemy. And from their inception, the Nicolaitan Catholic Christians that usurped the belief intentionally go out of their way to fulfill these foretellings. So they're actually, they're probably intentionally, and with the, pur the sole purpose of causing these things, having waste dumped into the waters, just to accomplish these things that were foretold. Right. So the, the video that just came out about the red tides goes into detail about that. If you watch some of the earlier videos, though, you can see over and over again, they intentionally would make these foretellings culminate in them, like naming Sixtus the first, second, and third. And by the time Sixtus the third came around, the things he intentionally set up 
line up with the abomination of desolation, the mark of the beast, and the other things that are mentioned because they they were following other writings. The Nag Hammadi Library that was found in Egypt has their Apollyon and Sophia talking to them, and they're literally enjoined to cause these things to be fulfilled on purpose. That's why they have all those observatories. They pay careful attention to what's going on and when, and they use gematria and numerology and all these other forms of witchcraft when they're trying to make their marching orders accomplished because they're doing these things in fulfillment of foretelling in scripture on purpose. So I'm not saying it's always like that, but you will definitely see whether modification is a thing they're given the ability to do this by our creator. But the the fact that you can have like snow during spring or an extremely warm winter and things being thrown out because of this weather manipulation is foretold right here. That, that was the point I was trying to make. Because of the sin of men, these perversions are allowed to happen. And you can find numerous witnesses to this the easiest one to see, go back to the book of Judges, when the children had no king but Yahuwah, and they were not walking according to his will, their enemies had jurisdiction over them, to rule over them, to be cruel and do what they would. That same thing is true today. It hasn't changed. But it says, and in, those, or in, in the days of the sinners, the years shall be shortened, and their seed shall be tardy on their lands and fields which is what you can see happen during the time of Abraham as well. They were doing sins and then birds were eating their, their, their seed and not allowing them to have their lands or fields produced for them. And there was famine, right? And all things on the earth shall alter and shall not appear in their time. And the rain shall be kept back and the Shemaim shall withhold. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be darkened and shall not grow in their time. And the fruits of the trees shall be withheld in their time. And the moon shall alter her order and not appear at her time. And remember what these represent as well. Okay. The fruits are what the fruits of the Ruach that are supposed to be produced in men who are like the fruit-bearing trees, right? The moon is the Malkuth, or the kingdom. Okay, the sun is the truth, like the bridegroom, okay? And in those days, the sun shall be seen, and he will journey in the evening on the extremity of the great chariot in the west, and shall shine more brightly than accords with the order of light. Now, I believe there's also a mention of this in either 4th Ezra or 2nd Baruch about the sun being at the extremity of its circuit, what we would call the, the shortest day of the year uh, for those in, in the uh, north of the equator. But when he's at the furthest circuit, he's going to shine extremely bright so that everyone can see it and this is going to be on the advent of when he returns, the light when he comes like the sun, or it says when he, he returns like lightning, but like the light comes from the east and even unto the west, so shall be the coming of the son of Adam. It could be this is what's being explained, where it's going to be at the extremity there and extremely bright, and he's going to make his round when he returns in that fashion. This is, and many chiefs of the stars shall transgress the order, and these shall alter their orbits and tasks and not appear at the seasons prescribed to them. What you see, what they represent, the stars or the, the men, the luminaries, the children of light that he's given to be lights in the world, and they're not keeping their orders self-explanatory. You can see that happening today not physical luminaries not being in the way they're supposed to but the parable of it whether this will literally happen we have yet to see it says yea they shall err and take them to be mighty ones which is what happened 
they they worshiped all the luminaries and bowed to the whole host of the Shamayim, right? And evil shall be multiplied upon them, and punishment shall come upon them so as to destroy all. Chapter 81. And he said unto me, Observe, Hanok, these Shemaim tablets, and read what is written thereon, and mark every individual fact. He's not the he's not the only one that's read these. Satan is familiar with the, the Shemaim tablets. That's why a lot of people are confused and they have issues with the idea of a solar false mighty one that returns from the dead and is born of a virgin. And you pretty much have all these different things that you can find in the good news in perverted mythologies from antiquity that predate his coming. But when you realize that the adversary of your soul, the, the very being who wants the destruction of all, was familiar with the things that would happen and intentionally puts out stuff to pervert the truth, it all makes a lot of sense. But back on point, Hanok observed these Shamayim tablets. He was able to read from them. Yaakov, in the book of Yobelim, was also shown seven tablets of the Shamayim that were brought down that showed all that would happen to him and his children throughout time. And he remembered all of it and wrote it down. So the idea that these things are foreknown, even when we lose his word in the world, it's still recorded in the Shamayim for us. And Ezra knew that. He had petitioned to be able to, to copy down these things for the posterity, and it was given to him to do so. There is a good, good possibility that we'll have the restoration of the truth in his world before he comes, where the, the word will be restored to what it's supposed to be, which I greatly look forward to, if at all possible in my lifetime. But it says, And I observed the Shemaim tablets and read everything which was written and comprehended everything, and read the book of all the deeds of mankind, and of all the children of flesh that shall be upon the earth, to the last generations. And forthwith I Baruch, or blessed, the great Yahuwah, the king of esteem forever, in that he has made all the works of the world. And I extolled Yahuwah because of his patience, and Baruch him because of the children of men. And after that I said, Baruch is the man who dies in righteousness and goodness, concerning whom there is no book of unrighteousness written, and against whom no day of judgment shall be found. The first mention of the books of life and the book of condemnation. Another witness for this is also in Gad the Seer, chapter 14. And what we have in the common scriptures, of course, in Revelation and what it mentions, I believe, in Yeshayahu. <clears throat> but on a yearly basis, on the, on the first of the seventh month, the three books are opened before the host of the Shemaim in the presence of the Father, and our Mashiach reads what is written in them. First, the deeds of the righteous, and then the deeds of the unintentional sinners, and then the deeds of the malicious sinners. And then if you want more information, I suggest you read chapter 14 of Gad the Seer. But to sum it up, the righteous are his and will live forever. The unintentional sinners, they put off and see what they'll do after 10 days, whether or not they repent on the day of atonement. And if they mourn for their sin, fast and afflict their beings, that they'll be forgiven for the unintentional sins that they commit. And then the malicious sinners, the ones that intentionally do evil and plot wickedness in their hearts are given over to satan for him to do with what he will and he takes them into the the wilderness to destroy them is what is mentioned that is a reminiscent of what will be with the great white throne judgment 
after Satan is released from his thousand year captivity, he will lead the world astray and those who will serve him will come up against the people in the land there. And that's when all creation will be consumed by fire. And then you'll have the great, uh, the general resurrection of the dead and the great white throne judgment for a week of years. But those again, who were made like messengers and were partakers of the first resurrection, this second death or this judgment will have nothing over them. Just like it mentions here, they died in righteousness and goodness concerning whom no book of unrighteousness is written and against whom no day of judgment shall be found. They will live forever and those that serve Satan will be tossed in the lake of fire with him. Where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. Chapter or verse five, it says, and those seven Kodeshim or set apart ones brought me and placed me on the earth before the door of my house and said to me, declare everything to your son, Methuselah, which Methus is his death, Selah will bring or his death is sent, right? And show to all your children that no flesh is righteous in the sight of Yahuwah, for he is their creator. One year we will leave you with your son till you give your commands that you may teach your children and record for them and testify to all your children. And in the second year they shall take you from their midst. Let your heart be strong. For the good shall announce righteousness to the good. The righteous with the righteous shall rejoice and shall offer congratulations to one another. But the sinners shall die with the sinners and the apostate go down with the apostate. And those who practice righteousness shall die on account of the deeds of men and be taken away on account of the doings of the unrighteous. And in those days they ceased to speak to me, and I came to my people, Baraka Yahuwah of the world, or blessing Yahuwah of the world. Chapter 82 And now, my son, Methuselah, all these things I am recounting to you and writing down for you. And I have revealed to you everything and given you books concerning all these. So preserve my son Methuselah, the books from your father's hand, and that you deliver them to the generations of the world. I have given Hokma to you and to your children and your children that shall be to you, that they may give it to their children for generations, this hokma or wisdom that surpasses their thought. And those who comprehend it shall not sleep, but shall listen with the ear that they may learn this hokma, and it shall please those that eat thereof better than good food. Right, sweeter than honey is how it's mentioned in the Proverbs, right? This hokmah is to taste and see what is good for you. If you remember, we went over that word before. It, it, it's to benefit men that we learn to do the will of our maker because it leads to unspeakable good for those who love him. Right? Baruch are all the righteous. Baruch, or blessed, are all those who walk in the way of righteousness and sin not as the sinners in the reckoning of all their days in which the sun transverses the Shemaim, entering into and departing from the portals for thirty days with the heads of thousands of the order of the stars, together with the four which are intercalated which divide the four portions of the year, which lead them and enter with them four days. Now, this part 
has been confusing to some people, but we're going to go ahead and read through it. And then I'm going to show you on the calendar how it lines up pretty, pretty well. Okay. With exactly what we, we hold to the leaders are the Hodeshim, the four beginnings of the month and the four, the, the four intercalary days, which divide the four portions of the year are the four 31st days of the four months that end the seasons. And we'll see that in just a moment. It says, Owing to them, men shall be at fault and not reckon them in the whole reckoning of the year. Yea, men shall be at fault and not recognize them accurately. For they belong to the reckoning of the year and are truly recorded forever, one in the first portal and one in the third and one in the fourth and one in the sixth, and the year is completed in 364 days. And the account thereof is accurate, and the recording, sorry, and the recorded reckoning thereof exact. For the luminaries, and months, and festivals, and years, and days, has Oriel shown and revealed to me, to whom Yahuwah of the whole creation of the world has subjected the host of the Shamayim. And he has power over night and day in the Shamayim to cause the light to give light to men, sun, moon, and stars, and all the powers of the Shamayim which revolve in their circular chariots. And these are the orders of the stars, which set in their places, and in their seasons, and festivals, and months. And these are the names of those who lead them, who watch that they enter at their times, in their orders, in their seasons, in their months, in their periods of dominion and in their positions. Their four leaders who divide the four parts of the year enter first. There you go. Okay, so right here, the four leaders that begin the seasons enter first. So you have the leader of the first of the first month, the first of the fourth month. Oops. Sorry about that. The first of the fourth month, the first of the seventh month, and the first of the tenth month. These are the four leaders of the, the seasons there, okay? But it says, and these are the orders of the stars which set in their places and in their seasons and their festivals and months. And these are the names of those who lead them, who watch that they enter at their times, in their orders, in their seasons, in their months, in their periods of dominion, and in their positions. Therefore, leaders who divide the four parts of the year enter first. Okay, And after them, the twelve leaders of the orders who divide the months. So you have... And you have the leaders of the seasons here that that have control over the 91 day period, right? One, two, three, four. And then you have the leaders of the months. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, okay? And it says, and after them were the leaders of the orders who divide the months and for the 360, days they are heads over thousands who divide the days okay so the next set of people or the next set of messengers that would come in would be the ones over each individual day of each period so leader of a thousand leader of a thousand leader of a thousand leader of a thousand all the way through 364 of them okay and after that, you have the last section. It says, and the four intercalary days, there are the leaders 
which sunder the four parts of the year. So after you have all of the ones that were already mentioned, then you have the four leaders that end the seasons. The longest day of the year, equal day and night, the shortest day of the year, and equal day and night being the last day of the year. And then it would repeat for the first right here on the fourth of the week. Ob willing, that was not too difficult and everyone can see how that lines up right there. But that's another, that's a second witness to the fact that these signs are not the same as the first when, that starts the season. It's at the end of them. Okay. The other one you can see is when you compare chapter 72 with how the calendar functions. The last day of the year is equal day and night. And then the first day of the year is afterwards. Comparatively longest day than the next season, equal day and night than the beginning of the fall, shortest day of the year than the beginning of winter, okay? And it says, and these heads over thousands are intercalated between leader and leader, each behind a station, but their leaders make the division. And these are the names of the leaders who divide the four parts of the year, which are ordained. Mikiel, Helimelech, and Mel Elyal, and Narel. Now, this one could be who is like El, Mikael. This one, Helimelech, is something to do with a king. I, I, I'd have to look into that more again. I don't remember what this one is, but Narel is the lamp or the light, like the lamp of El. Okay, and those are the four different names of the sun during the four seasons of the year. And the names of those who lead them, Adnarel and Iususael and Ilomiel, these three follow the leaders of the orders. And there is one that follows the three leaders of the orders, which follow those leaders of stations that divide the four parts of the year. Meaning you have the names of the leaders that head the seasons, okay? Then you have the names for the leaders of the months, at least for the, the first month. And then you'd have the leader that is the for the sign or the last day of the year that divides the four parts, okay? Now it's going to go into detail about the names of the, the leader for spring and then for summer, but we don't have the other two after that. I believe in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it did cover that portion, but I don't have it available at the moment. We might dig that up later and look into it. But as it stands, we only have the first two seasons right here that are talked about and the effects that they have. This is a third witness, however, for how the calendar functions in reality and something you can look to. It says, in the beginning of the year, Mikael rises first and rules, whose name is Tamani, which Tam is perfection, right? And Ani is like my perfection. Whose name is Tamani and son. And all the days of his dominion, whilst he bears rule, are 91 days. So again, the leader over this season, ruling for 91 days, and that would be the effect of what we have spring. And these are the signs of the days which are to be seen on earth in the days of his dominion. Sweat and heat and calms and all the trees bear fruit, and leaves are produced on all the trees, and the harvest of wheat, and the rose flowers, and all the flowers which come forth in the field. But the trees of the winter season become withered. Oh, sorry about that. So during spring, you have first barley harvest right here, and then the wheat harvest, which is during this time the wheat is being produced. Leaves and grass are growing everywhere, and things are becoming fruitful, right? It's 
it's developing to produce the fruits in the summertime, which we'll just cover in just a moment. And these are the names of the leaders which are under them. Barakel, or Berkael, Zelebzel, and another who is added a head of a thousand called Hiliusaf, or Hiliyasaf, Hiluyasaf, sorry. And the days of the dominion of this are at an end. The next leader after him is Helamelech, whom one names the Shining Sun. And all the days of his light are 91 days. So this would be the next leader over the summer month, if you will. And these are the signs of his days on the earth, glowing heat and dryness, and the trees ripen their fruits and produce all their fruits ripe and ready. And the sheep pair and become pregnant. And all the trees of the earth are gathered in. And everything that is in the fields and the wine press, these things take place in the days of his dominion. These are the names. And see, this is where it skips out. You don't hear about the other two or any of them in between in detail, right? And these are the names and the orders and the leaders of those heads of thousands, Gedayaal, Kiel, and Hiel. And the name of the head of a thousand which is added to them is Asphael. And the days of his dominion are at an end. And then you can see that that was for spring and for summer but you don't have fall and winter. However, the effects and the signs you can see in reality don't change. And that's how you can tell when a season is actually in season or you can start getting the buddings of it. Like you might be able to see a little bit of green here and there on a few things before spring, but on the day, the beginning of spring and every day after, it's universally prevalent. There's no way around it. All right, just one moment, resume. So Shalom again, I wanted to share something with everyone. This is from what they call the Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition. In hard copy, it is a two volume set and you can get the PDF for free online still, which I believe has all of it, but it's not as up to date as some of the newer publications. <clears throat> In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have a whole bunch of the, the common scriptures or the words that were already known to be his, as well as the apocryphal, apocryphal writings, Yobelim, Yashar, or, or not Jasher, sorry, but um, Hanok, Baruch, 4th Ezra. They have uh, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. They have some of these fragments of them for all of the known apocrypha that I'm familiar with. The only writings that I don't know that they have that might be legitimate is the book of Esther. And you also have like the Ascension of Yeshiyahu, which they didn't, I'm not familiar if they found a copy. They may have found copies of some of the renewed covenant writings in Greek and other languages, but those are pretty much kept hush hush. Before we moved on into the book of Hanok, it's going to go into the visions that he'd seen. I wanted to cover a little bit about this, and it's a little overlapping, but I wanted you to see there's extra witnesses for the things that you're going to cover. One of the writings that you have in the book of Hanok happens to be the birth of Noah, or Noah, his great-grandson, and that is also mentioned in what they call right here the Genesis Apocryphon which happens to be like the first-hand witness or the first-hand accounts of Noah, Lemek, and Abraham. So anyways, this Genesis Apocryphon is literally like the first-hand accounts of these patriarchs 
It's what I believe was may have been the original book of Yashar or the Upright, where it was the firsthand accounts of, of these people. They were written in succession. But just to get back on track here, it's in a lot of fragments. I just want to kind of point out what it's talking about here. This is mentioning about the, the messengers and what happened with the with the fallen ones that came. Okay. This part in particular. Yeah, I didn't mean to skip that much. Sorry about that. I usually have it on continuous scroll. That's why. There you go. So it goes, it will go from English to Hebrew to English to Hebrew because it's showing, it's the study edition. It's showing you the Hebrew text and then translating it. All right. But right here, he's having a vision. And then you can see the Hebrew for it. We don't want to get into this too much because we can spend a long time just looking. Right. And then it's talking about with the planting and the mystery of evil. Okay. What happened, and we'll, we'll see it more clearly, Ob willing, we can see it here. But um, these men were writing about the things that were going on in their times. And if you remember from the time of Jared or Yerod, he will come down. That's when the watchers had came and started trying to teach men righteousness and ended up mating with some women and causing the Nephilim to be in the world. So right here, this is the part... We'll read a little bit of this one, but this is the part I was talking about with the father of Noah when he when Noah was being born. This is, I believe, chapter 105 in the book of Hanok, but this version has a little bit more to it, okay? And again, like the book of Hanok itself is an abridgment of what was originally given, some of the things in it are kind of abridged or, or missing what was originally written there. So you can see a little bit of that right here just for context, okay? I don't want to get like it gets a little saucy because he, he you'll see in just a minute. It says, behold, then I thought in my heart that the conception was of the watchers, meaning the birth of his son. And for context there, it mentions in Yobelim. But when Noah was born, he was singing praises as, a, as an infant. And when he opened his eyes, it would light up the room like it was noonday or noontime. And he was, I believe he might have been glowing a little bit. But it says, Behold, then I thought in my heart that the conception was of the watchers and the pregnancy of the, the set-apart ones, and it belonged to the Nephilim. And my heart within me was upset on account of this boy. Then I, Lemek, was frightened and turned to Bitnosh, or Bit Enosh, Bet the house of Enosh, that's the name of his wife, Bet Enosh, right? My wife, and said, Behold, I adjure you by the Most High, by the Great Master, by the King of all ages. And then he's, he's asking, you know, the sons of Shemaim, if Noah was born of them, right? That you tell me in truth everything, whether, and it breaks off, Tell me without lies whether this, and it breaks off, by the king of all ages, that you are speaking to me frankly and without lies. So basically, he wanted to be reassured very much so that this was his child. And he was asking his wife to tell him the truth. And then his wife was a little upset about the accusation and spoke harshly, but then she tried to, con to convince him that he was the only one that she's ever, ever had the pleasure of being with in that capacity. Right, We don't need to get into the details there, but you can take the time to read it if you will. Pause that to your heart's content. All right. I just want to show you that this is an account that is also in the book of Hanok. They call it an interpolation because it wasn't exactly written by him. And you can see how it first happened here. It's a little more detailed. After the writing right here of, the, of Lemek, his son, or his father, though, and their encounter, he goes to Methuselah, his father, and Methuselah goes to Hanok and asks him about it. And he, right here, see, he ran to Hanok, his father, in order to know everything reliably. And he told him not to worry because it is his son, and he told him the things that were going to happen, right? 
You can see this more clearly if you just read the account that's in the book of Hanok, which we'll get to. But in here, again, you have some things that are, are missing from there, a little more detail on occasion. And then it goes right here. This is the book of the words of Noach, right? And then it goes on from his, his personal writing, and this is in his person. He says, he was born from in righteousness, and in the crucible of her who was pregnant with me, I burst forth for truth. And when I emerged from my mother's interior, I was planted for truth. In all my life, I behaved in truth and walked in the paths of eternal ver verity. <clears throat> and with me, the set apart, and it breaks off, on my tracks, truth hastened and to caution me against the path of falsehood, which led to darkness. And he talks about how he girdled his loins with the vision of truth and wisdom, and he walked accordingly. Okay. This is then I, Noah, became a man. I held fast to truth and clung to, it breaks off, and I married Amzara. And it's going on into his a little more detail about his life there. The interesting thing that I want to share is just a moment if they, yeah, it's right up here. The reason why I'm sharing this is because we have, we have witnesses of the things confirming what you can see in the common scriptures and how it ties into the book like Yobelim and Hanok. They all go together. But it says, and she became pregnant from me and bore three sons. For my sons, I took wives for, from my brother's daughters, and my daughters I gave to my brother's sons, according to the eternal law. So it was a law at that time to give to the sons of, of your brothers or sisters, your, your, your daughters, and vice versa. After the children were given the Torah, you're not allowed to, to take your son's daughter or your, your sister's son or daughter for your children it's not it's supposed to be cousins now and not directly th that closely related but before then this was established this is another example of how he can make he can make his rules and change them as he pleases which we do see happen on occasion this is the highest one to the sons of men and in my days when there had been completed for me according to the calculation that I calculated, all right, 10 Yobelim, then my sons finished taking wives from themselves. Now, it, it mentions here and in a few other places, he calculated when to get married, he calculated when to have children and when to get the wives for his children according to what he had found to be written and in relation to the stars. That kind of thing, looking to the stars to find the, the times and when things would happen, is exactly what you see going throughout the book of Revelation from the time of our Mashiach all the way to our current times. And it's still playing out, which is why I wanted to share this, because the same thing he was doing here in a micro scale is what you can see overtly for the world in how the luminaries are supposed to be regarded. This is the... In a vision I saw was shown and informed of the deed of the sons of Shemaim and how all it breaks off. And I hid this mystery in my heart and did not make it known to anyone. Right. It talks about how he was sent by a messenger. Right. And he had visions spoken to him. And he was told, this is important. Our Mashiach came to him. The great set apart one called out to me. He says, to you, Noach, they say, and I considered by myself all the behavior of the sons of the earth, and I knew and demonstrated all, right? But Noach found favor. And then the set-apart great one also tells him, if I can find it, that he will be with him and with those of his sons that are like him forever. And this is where he made the offering on the 15th of the third month right here. There's only one more part I really want to show you. And these are really good to read, but when you have fragments missing and there's chunks that are messed out, if you're not intimately familiar with the events and what's going on, it can be confusing. So I don't want to do 
I don't want to do that to you. But this is when he was at the door of the ark and he walked through the breadth and length of the land and he was looking at it, right? Then he praised Yahuwah. He says, he is eternal and he is entitled to praise. And I once more Baruch because he had mercy on the earth and because he had removed and destroyed from it all the workers of violence, wickedness and deceit. But he delivered for his sake. And it probably says he delivered me and my family for his sake, right? And, he's, and he talked with me and said to me, this is our Mashiach, right? Do not be afraid, Noach. I am with you and with your sons who will be like you forever. Like Abraham, right? And he gave them dominion to rule over all of them, over its, right? And he says, in its deserts and its mountains and over all that is in them. And behold, I give to you and to your sons everything to eat of the vegetables and herbs of the earth, but you shall eat no blood of any kind. The fear and dread of you right, shall be on all the animals. And he had shut up the mouths of the animals after the fall. Just for a moment. Yeah, go ahead. So... Sorry about that. Long story short, you can see where this is in relation to where he was speaking with our Mashiach and then he was given dominion over the earth. He walked around in it. He was told not to eat blood. Right. And then it goes into the account where he was on the mountains of Oratu or Ararat and he had made. Um, he got the allotment for his children. Right. He had made wine. This is also mentioned in the book of Yobelim. And then when he had made the wine on the first of the first month, he enjoyed it. And that's when it says that he got drunk and he was and he, he was uncovered in his tent and Ham saw him. However, in the Dead Sea Scrolls here, he had a vision during that time. And this is part of that vision. It's kind of broken up, but it's about a tree, a cypress and an olive tree and the, the fruitfulness of the olive tree, how it's being cut up by all these different things, the sun and the moon and the stars and the waters and other things were taking of it. And these were the different branches of his family after he came. He was the olive tree and they were all the ones that came from him. So he saw during this vision that he had while he was while he had enjoyed the wine, he'd seen all that would happen to him and his children. And it was after that that he knew what had happened with Ham and he cursed Canaan, if you recall. So a little bit different context than what we're familiar with because we don't have any record of this vision that he had seen in the common scriptures. But it's quite prevalent. And it, unfortunately, it's in fragments here. But when you read it and you, you take a good look, it, it covers the history of his children and the things that were going to happen, right? And then it moves on and it has the sons dividing the land by lot. And it goes on for that a little bit more. And then you have um, in the Genesis Apocryphon, it goes straight into the time of Abraham. Yeah, see, like right here. Now, this is the first hand writing from Abraham's time where he was keeping like his journal and where he went into the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt during the times of his sojourning, right? We don't need to go too far into that, but this is where I get the idea that, that the Genesis Apocryphon was the original book of y Yeshar or the upright because it has the first hand accounts where it says, I. And it's speaking as if these men are writing it themselves of the upright that were kept through the ages. So thank you all for your time. When we continue, we're going to get back on the book of Hanok and start covering the divisions that he had. Which if we had this one and you overlay it with the vision of the, uh, the animal apocalypse that we're going to read next week. And you compare it to the other things that are right in scripture, you can see... He was being shown what was going to take place with his posterity and then handed it down to them. Abraham would have had these writings and he would have been reading it, which is the context you have for the book of Yobelim, where he says, I know these things and this is going to happen to your children and da-da-da-da. 
because he literally read about it and he was familiar. We can follow that along with them as we go. So thank you for your time. You have a wonderful Shabbat and we will see you next week. Have a great week ahead as well. Shalom.